It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the AOC CQ32G3SU, also known as the CQG3SE in some markets, in a slightly modified form. And I will run through the differences in this review between the two models. As usual, there's a full written review, which this video is a part of. The written review is full of measurements and it has more technical detail about the monitor. This video review is really just designed to give some visual demonstrations which aid that written review. Speaking of visual demonstrations, they're mainly in-game examples I use, but what I'm showing you here and what I'm discussing, it applies to the monitor itself and its capabilities, and it would apply more broadly than that as well. If you're watching movies, if you're just on the desktop browsing the internet, that kind of thing, a lot of the points I make are very relevant there as well. Be aware that what you see depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately depends on the screen that you're viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what you'd see from the monitor first hand. This monitor has a 31.5 inch 2560 by 1440, that's WQHD or 1440p resolution. It has a VA panel and it has a 1000R, that's a relatively steep curve. You'll be able to see that curve very clearly in the video. There's a sort of pin cushion effect in the video or photos you'll see of the monitor. And when you're actually using the monitor, it doesn't really have this pin cushion effect, but I would say that the curve is definitely a feature and it's something which you do adapt to a bit over time, or I did over time, but I'm still quite conscious of the curve when I'm generally using the monitor, especially when I'm on the desktop or I'm playing certain game content. So if I'm playing a game like Battlefield where I'm shifting my eyes from the center of the screen to the edge of the screen quite a bit as you're scanning the horizon or whatever it might be, then I do become aware of the curve. If I'm on the desktop, I'm aware of the curve as well, although I have to say that has lessened a bit over time. I've used the monitor for a few weeks now. But when I'm engrossed in a movie or playing a casual game, I tend to focus more on the centre of the screen, or well, I'm just generally not as aware of the curve. It's something which some people are going to like, other people not so much. I do find it draws you in a bit, adds a little bit of extra depth and that kind of thing. I don't really find it annoying, although personally I get on quite well with flat screens of this size as well, so it just is a personal preference. The resolution then, 2560 by 1440. It doesn't give you an amazing pixel density, it's slacker than a 27 inch WQHD model and it's slacker than a 4K UHD model of this kind of size, 32 inches or so, and certainly smaller than that. So you don't get the same kind of crispness and clarity as you do there, but it's not bad in that respect in terms of the pixel density. It's similar to a 24 inch Full HD model, that's 1920 by 1080 or 1080p. And that's a size and resolution combination which quite a few people are quite used to and will find quite comfortable. So I'm not using any scaling here. So you get a good amount of text on the screen at the same time, so a decent multitasking potential and that kind of thing. It gives you a reasonable level of detail for games and suitably high resolution image content, but again, not as good as those tighter pixel densities would give. Another issue with this model, which I explore more in the written review if you look at the start of the calibration section is that it uses something called partial subpixel illumination. So each subpixel is divided into two separate sections and they don't all light up at the same time for text or fine edges and that does cause some issues with text and fine edge clarity. Things look a bit softer than they should. Not everyone will notice this and actually oddly enough some people kind of like this look, the slightly softer look to things, but it is a personal thing. Some people will find it a bit annoying. So be aware of that, and again, it's explored at the start of the calibration section of the written review. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So a few things to note from the front. There are these little red cheek pieces, if you like. That's actually dark red. It's kind of a dark, slightly metallic effect, so it's not as bright as it tends to look on videos or pictures of the monitor. So it doesn't really catch the eye when you're using the monitor normally, or I didn't find it did. There's the same kind of thing there. There's a little cable tidy loop with the same sort of colour. Elsewhere, matte black plastics used, and you can see these rather long front feet of the stand and shorter back feet of the stand, so that's another design feature if you like. Bottom bezel is reasonably thick. The top and side bezels are dual stage, which means they have a slim panel border that's flush with the rest of the screen and when the screen switched off as it is now it just blends in seamlessly you will see it elsewhere in the video when the screen switched on and then there's a slender hard plastic outer part as well the curve of the screen won't escape your notice in pictures or videos or really when you're using the monitor in general but there's a sort of pincushion effect when you look at 
pictures and videos of the monitor, like you're looking at right now. And it does tend to exaggerate the curve. In practice, it's not as noticeable. But I do explore its effect on the image elsewhere in the review. There is a light matte anti-glare screen surface, and you'll see that the glare on this one is a little bit weird in terms of the glare handling, it's a bit odd, and that's because of the curve. So I find when I'm sitting in front of the monitor, so it's a light matte anti-glare screen surface, the glare handling directly, it's quite reasonable. It's not as strong as some matte screen surfaces, but it's stronger than others. And because it's a light matte anti-glare finish, it doesn't have the same kind of impact on the image as stronger matte screen surfaces, as I explore elsewhere in the review. But with the glare handling, it tends to stretch the glare out across the screen. So from a normal viewing position, you might notice little patches of glare perhaps at the side. And then if you move slightly off angle, it basically stretches that glare across the screen. So you might be able to see my hand at the moment, which looks like it's massively stretched across the screen, rather than just there being a relatively small patch of glare. So it's a bit of a weird one. And I actually find that when I'm using it normally, it's fine. If I move slightly off angle, the glare tends to flood the image if I'm in a reasonably bright room. So it is something to be aware of. The glare handling is a bit odd because of the curve. In terms of its ergonomics, it offers tilt, swivel and height adjustment. And you can see the exact amounts you can adjust things by in the written review in the features and aesthetics section there. There are also some measurements such as the total depth of the stand and that kind of thing. What I would say about the stand depth though is that yes, these front feet are rather long, but the screen itself goes a bit further back. So you can actually have the screen reasonably close to the wall if you don't have a particularly deep desk. But again, if you're using the stand that comes with it, you will have to accommodate these rather large feet. At the rear, remember this is the SU model I'm looking at here. The SE model has a different stand attachment. It has it lower down. And I said that the stand offers tilt and height adjustment as well as swivel. Well, the SE model only offers tilt adjustment. Another difference is that this model has integrated speakers behind those red grills there, whereas the SE model doesn't. And another difference are these down-facing USB ports. They're only found on this SU model rather than the SE model. And you'll see that there are four USB 3.2 ports. The yellow coloured one supports fast charging for connected devices. And there's also an upstream port or USB type B port. The control buttons are found at the bottom of the monitor. This is explored in the OSD video. So they're towards the right side if you're looking at the monitor from the front, towards the left if you're looking at it from the rear as I am at the moment. The stand attaches using a quick release mechanism on the U model or the SU model. You can see that there. So you just flick that switch up or push it upwards and then you can detach the screen and you'll find 100 by 100 millimeter vessel holes after doing that. The SE model also has vessel holes but they're just always there on the outside of the monitor because the stand design is different. The ports face downwards, there are two HDMI 2.0 ports and they support the native 2560 by 1440 WQHD resolution. They also support AMD FreeSync on compatible systems and GPUs and a 144Hz maximum refresh rate. It also supports HDR, which you can use at the same time as VRR and other technologies which I've already mentioned. There's DisplayPort 1.2a, and that supports up to 165Hz at the native resolution, and you have support for Adaptive Sync, which includes AMD FreeSync, as well as NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. And it's AMD FreeSync Premium, which is specifically supported by this model but you can use HDR at the same time if you like as these VRR technologies and that includes with Nvidia's G-Sync compatible mode as well. There's then a 3.5mm headphone jack and an AC power input so the monitor has an internal power converter. There's also a K slot there, a Kensington lock slot. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. So this one has a VA panel, contrast is one of its main strengths. With this one I measured around 2100, a little bit above 2100 to 1 for the static contrast using my test settings. So this isn't by any means phenomenal for a VA model, but it still lifts it above what an IPS or TN model would be able to provide without some kind of fancy local dimming. So this does give a better atmosphere, better depth to things, and that's useful on titles like this with plenty of dark areas and dark scenes. But if you're sitting in a dark room, as I am now, don't expect things to look really deep, inky and atmospheric, because that isn't how things look. You'll be able to see this sort of fogginess towards the bottom of the screen and the top. You, depending on how you're sitting, 
this will appear a bit different. So I've got the camera mounted fairly centrally and with the size of the screen, you might see this a bit more towards the top, but the ergonomically correct viewing position would have you having your eyes a little bit further up. And this is actually a combination of things. It's VA Glow, but it is also brought out a bit more strongly on my unit by clouding in this region. So if you've got issues with backlight bleed or clouding, it does bring out this VA glow more strongly, which is why it tends to be found towards the bottom or the top edges of the screen. It's not like IPS glow, it's not as strong, it's not as intense as IPS glow, it doesn't cover as much of the screen, but it does still have an effect, as you can clearly see from the video. There's more of a contrast than with IPS glow because the, the contrast in the center of the screen, that gives a better depth to the darker shades. It does mean the visual contrast between the glow areas and the central area is more prominent. Also be aware that if you lighten up the room a bit, you're not, I wouldn't recommend sitting in a pitch black room, even with a VA model, then it certainly takes the edge off things. I wouldn't say this is a bright room, it just isn't pitch black anymore, so it's a bit brighter, and the perceived contrast is much better. So if you do have to sit in a dark room, I'd highly recommend having some lighting behind your monitor, like a bias light or something like that, and that can really help with perceived contrast if your room is otherwise dark. But even in this kind of lighting condition, there is a difference between the black of the bezel, which is pure black, and what should be black. Around 2000 to 1 with the contrast, you know, it's not pure black by any means. Another thing to be aware of, with this being a VA panel, is that the gamma consistency isn't as strong as on IPS models. So that means that when you view a shade towards the centre of the screen, it doesn't appear the same as when it's viewed towards the edge of the screen. So for scenes like this, and considering the darker shades, this means that in the centre of the screen, there's what's called black crush. This is very difficult to see in the video, and actually it's massively exaggerated in the video. It looks like there's no detail at all there, but to the eye there definitely is. And the black crush levels on this model actually aren't bad at all. It is still there, don't get me wrong, it is still there, it's still a VA panel. So what you tend to find is that some very dark shades blend in too much. They blend into a sort of black or darker than it should be mass of shade. Whereas when you view those same shades lower down or towards the edges of the screen, then the detail levels pick up. There's actually a bit of an excess of detail towards the very bottom of the screen and the very side edges where perceived gamma, rather than being too high, is actually too low. I haven't completely given up on trying to demonstrate the black crush. So what you see here is a black background with very dark gray text, which has PCM on it. And the camera has been adjusted to completely exaggerate things. You'll be able to see the taskbar down there looks completely overexposed. So you will see some strange brightness, which you don't see to the eye. However, you can see that the letters PCM are much more blended centrally or the region which is in line with your eyes, or in this case, the camera versus lower down the screen and also higher up the screen because it is a large screen and I've got the cameras mounted quite centrally at the moment. So this is just a quick demonstration of what Black Crush can do and the fact that it does exist on this monitor. For brighter shades, the screen surface is quite smooth and quite light as well. So it doesn't give you the same kind of layered appearance that stronger screen surfaces would. And it doesn't give you the same sort of grainy appearance either. There's just a light misty graininess. And in terms of the layering, yes, it's not quite as good as some IPS models I've tested recently, for example, with what I'd classify as light to very light matte or very light matte screen surfaces, but it's not bad at all in that respect. So your screen surface is essentially something which most people are going to find rather agreeable on this model and not something to worry about. I'm now going to talk about colour reproduction and start off I'm using a Legom, Legom.nl, and that tests for viewing angles there. The Legom text on this, it has a region which is more blended, which is in line with the camera or your eyes, and then it has a stronger red striping to the text further out. But overall, it does have a fair red striping. And actually, some regions of the screen towards the edge, because of the curvature, it also shows this more blended appearance. These sort of spots, if you like, they will move if you shift your head as well. But it's not like what you'd see on a TN model, where you'd get obvious flashes of green to orange. So what this is telling you is that this model has a moderate view angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. It's what you typically see for a VA model, although this one's actually a bit better than some VA models in this respect. Sometimes you'd see a very distinct cone, which is more blended than the rest of the screen, and it suddenly becomes much more colorful further out. This one doesn't have that to the same extent. The purple block looks a pinkish purple throughout the screen, 
it is a bit stronger with its pink tint towards the bottom of the screen. This always looks really odd on the video, by the way, so don't pay too much attention to what you can see, just what I'm saying here, and towards the extreme edges of the screen. But these shifts aren't as pronounced as I've seen on most VA models, actually, so this one is a little bit better in that respect, but it doesn't have that kind of consistency of an IPS-type model again. The red block, that looks a little bit duller towards the edges of the screen, but it's a vibrant red throughout the screen in general, quite a rich red. And it doesn't have as much of a pink hue as you often see on VA models towards the bottom of the screen or the side edges or the top of the screen, depending on your viewing position. So the shifts aren't as pronounced as you often see on VA, but the consistency isn't up there with a decent IPS model. Be aware that the shifts I'm talking about as well, I'm viewing the screen from around 70 centimetres, or that's my typical viewing position, 70 to 80 centimetres. Uh, if you're sitting closer to the screen than that, then these shifts do become more pronounced. Not sure if that'll come across on the video, but the edges of the screen do look noticeably deeper than the centre of the screen, duller. And you're sitting a bit closer versus further out. The green block, that looks a good consistent saturated green chartreuse shade throughout the screen. No real complaints here, and actually there is a bit of yellowing towards the bottom of the screen, but that again isn't extreme for the panel type. So overall the consistency of this is actually very good for a VA panel. Again, not up there with IPS type models, but better than what I'd typically see for VA models. And that's quite impressive, especially given the size of the screen. The blue block, as usual, that appears a good rich royal blue throughout the screen. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. So overall, things do look vibrant. Again, there is a bit of saturation lost towards the bottom of the screen and the side edges or the top of the screen, depending on your viewing position. This is stronger for some shades than others. I tend to find that this is actually more noticeable for some pastel shades. It's quite difficult to show this on the video because in this case, as I mentioned, the shifts are hardly extreme, They're actually too subtle to really show on the video. You can see it a little bit for the autumnal shades here on the leaf. You can see they dull a bit towards the bottom of the screen. They're a bit more vibrant centrally. But this isn't an extreme shift compared to some VA models. It's just that the colour consistency isn't up there with your typical IPS type model. But still, overall, a vibrant look, as I said, and part of that vibrancy is down to the colour gamut of the monitor. This one extends a fair bit beyond sRGB. I recorded 90% of the DCI-P3 colour space, so I'll just flash that up on the screen so you know what I'm talking about. So this invites some extra vibrancy for most content. Most content, such as this game running in SDR, it's designed with the sRGB colour space in mind, so when you're viewing that content on a monitor with a wider colour gamut, it does invite extra saturation and extra vibrancy. This isn't like a digital saturation control, so increasing game colour in the OSD of this monitor, for example. What that does is that pulls shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So you actually maintain good shade variety if you have an expanded colour gamut giving you this extra saturation. Some people will like this extra vibrancy, and because it's 90% DCI-P3 rather than closer to 100% DCI-P3, or even some extension beyond DCI-P3, it does mean that the extra saturation isn't extreme in this case. But I do tend to notice that some reds are rather fiery. The fire here, great example of that. Some of the oranges verge too much on red, some of the yellowish oranges verge too much on a reddish orange, if that makes sense. So things are just given a bit more of a red hue. I also notice with the wood of the rifle there, and just some of the autumnal colours around here, and some of the earthy tones as well, they have more of a red push than they should have as well. So they don't look a neutral brown, they look a bit more red. But this isn't extreme again. This isn't as extreme as it would be on models with a much wider colour gamut than this, and some models do offer a much wider colour gamut than this. So the woody tone there, for example, is actually fairly neutral, although it does have a bit of a red push. And because of the saturation losses lower down the screen, if anything, it actually looks more appropriate towards the bottom of the screen. But again, it's not an extreme shift. And I don't find that skin tones tend to have an overly sunburnt look on this monitor, as they would with a monitor with an even more generous colour gamut. I mean, they do have too much richness, really, too much saturation, particularly centrally, but it's not extreme in this case. For the green shades as well, you can see this extra saturation. So some of the yellowish greens have the yellow components brought out too strongly. But overall, these kind of shades don't have the sort of neon look that some models will give with an even more generous colour gamut. Sky blues as well, they're brought out a bit too strongly, although the sky in this scene is actually kind of a, a greyish blue. It looks largely as it should actually, 
Uh, there's a little patch there, yeah, a little patch there, which is a little bit more saturated than it should be, but this isn't extreme again, you know, not strong extra saturation. So I think most people are going to find the overall levels of saturation quite decent on this model. If, however, you do prefer things to look more appropriate, more as the developers intend, you like to tone things down, there is an sRGB emulation setting. It's found in the OSD under color setup, color temp. You change that from user or whatever else you were using to sRGB. This clamps the gamut so it's close to sRGB without so much overextension. And it does tone these things down. For example, the browns are toned down, the oranges are toned down so they don't look so reddish now. This fire here, for example, doesn't have the verging on red as it had before. But the sRGB emulation setting isn't exactly perfect on this model by any stretch of the imagination. To explore more in the written review in the calibration section and also the colour reproduction section there if you're interested in the technical details. But my main issue is that you can't adjust the brightness with this setting active and you can't adjust the colour channels or anything like that. It does restrict what you can access in the OSD. So you'll see that the colour channels are locked off. You can only change them in user mode, which would deactivate the sRGB setting. And for the luminance section, a lot of that is greyed out. You can't change the gamma, contrast or brightness. And it's locked to a moderately high brightness setting. It's not extreme, but it is higher than some people would like. And actually it's lower than some people would like. So it really is a nasty inflexibility to have, having the brightness locked off like that. There are some alternative sRGB emulation settings. They're all explored in the written review. I talk about this and there's an article on the website all about sRGB emulation and actually an accompanying video on this YouTube channel as well, all about sRGB emulation. So definitely check that out if you're interested in this because you can do this GPU side in a way which will allow you to gain full control of the brightness, color channels and everything else on the monitor. If you're looking to do colour critical work with this monitor, do be aware of those colour consistency issues I highlighted earlier. Although for a VA model, as I said, it's not too bad. It still isn't up there with IPS type models, so it's not perfect for consistent colours throughout the screen. Also be aware of the colour gamut, so you have extension beyond sRGB natively. But if you've got a colorimeter or a similar device, that's really what you'd need for the best accuracy there. So you'd have appropriate mapping of the gamut appropriate clamping of sRGB with additional corrections made. If you don't have a colorimeter, then do explore those sRGB emulation options probably on the, the graphics driver rather than the more restrictive monitor side setting as well. But if you want to work within wider color spaces such as DCI-P3 or Adobe RGB, the coverage levels there are really too low for accurate output. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm running the game in HDR. So I'm going to talk about the HDR performance of the monitor. This monitor falls short even of the lowest VESA Display HDR standard, VESA Display HDR 400. So the peak luminance I recorded on this one was 320 candles per meter squared. So that's not HDR like at all. It's reasonably bright if you consider it by SDR standards, but by HDR standards really isn't. The other thing is that there's no local dimming used, so the backlight is all controlled as one unit. It doesn't even use dynamic contrast, so when you're looking at darker scenes, it's actually just as if you've got the backlight set in SDR to pretty much maximum brightness, or maximum brightness. So it doesn't give you a great deep atmospheric look. The fact it's a VA panel with decent contrast does help a bit in that respect, but it certainly doesn't give the kind of look that you should get under HDR by any stretch of the imagination. In the video, this looks very deep perhaps, but in reality it's quite flooded looking. It's just the camera adjusting, but you do still get some benefits from HDR, you just don't get them on the luminance side or the contrast side. I'm testing with an NVIDIA RTX 3090 at the moment. I also tested with an AMD GPU and I found the experience largely the same. I've also tested with HDMI. The only difference was when I was using HDMI on my AMD GPU, it made things a little bit richer, a little bit deeper, a little bit oversaturated actually, less as it should look. It wasn't a huge difference, but just a bit of a difference that I noticed. It just seemed to lift the gamma up just a little bit basically. And also it caused some darker shades to look more crushed together than they should, so the distinctions weren't quite as good as they could be. But again, it wasn't an extreme difference. Be aware of this though, because if you're a games console user, you're going to be using AMD hardware with HDMI, so you're likely to have the kind of representation which I had with my AMD GPU. But the overall experience under HDR, the things I'm talking about with the luminance control, and I'm going to be talking about with the 10-bit color reproduction as well, that kind of thing, it applies all the same. So really, it's still a very limited HDR experience. 
Also be aware you can use AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode at the same time as HDR on this model, that's not a problem. The other thing to be aware of before moving on to the other aspects of HDR, which I'm eager to talk about, is that the OSD is greatly restricted, the settings in the OSD if you're running under HDR. So you can't change the brightness, it's locked at this high brightness level. You can't change the contrast or the gamma or anything like that, it's quite usual for these things to be restricted. You can't access the colour setup menu either, that's all greyed out so you can't adjust the colour channels. There is a setting though that you can adjust HDR and it says display HDR at the moment. It might be difficult to see in the video because it's a little bit flooded, a little bit bright. You can change that to HDR picture. That really floods things out. It lifts things up. It destroys the dark detail. It just looks really quite wrong. It also oversaturates things, lifts shades out too much, not in a good way. And it applies a mild sharpness filter as well. Some people might like that. It's not an extreme sharpness filter in this case, but that's what it does. Next is HDR Movie. That ramps up the sharpness filter further, and it really just does more of the same, except a bit of a stronger effect, it seems. So things really look rather artificial and weird. The oversaturation is rather obvious now. Things really don't look as they should, and the over sharpening is quite ugly in my opinion. It's an HDR game. And that seems to be a little bit less extreme with its gamma. It doesn't have the sharpness filter applied, so that's good, but it's very strong with its oversaturation. So this isn't a look which I like at all. It's not how things are supposed to look under HDR, but then you could argue that no matter what this monitor does, it's not really gonna be looking like it should under HDR anyway. So, you know, if you prefer how things look with this setting, by all means use it, but I'm gonna go back to my preferred display HDR setting now. So one of the advantages with the HDR10 pipeline, which this monitor uses HDR10 content it responds to, is that it has Support for 10-bit colour processing. The monitor is actually using an 8-bit panel. So there's a dithering stage which is applied by the GPU to make up the 10-bit signal. I've used this on various monitors before where the monitor does it with some settings and the GPU will do it with other settings, applying this dithering. And honestly, it makes very little difference in practice, so don't stress about that. It still achieves what it should achieve and that is to give you an enhanced nuanced shade variety. So there is a better variety of very subtly different dark shades, and this gives an uplift of detail, which is beyond what you'd see in SDR, and it's beyond what you could achieve with a gamma enhancement or that kind of thing. So it's just a more natural look in my opinion. It also alleviates some of that black crush I talked about, although it doesn't fully alleviate it, it is still there a little bit, so that does still have an effect. It just helps offset it a bit in my view. It also helps at the high end, so these bright shades, which don't look like that, I'm just going to adjust the camera, they look a little bit more like that, I guess, but you're not going to be able to see exactly what they look like, I'm afraid. This isn't an HDR video, and I have no idea of the capability of your monitor, etc, etc. But anyway, gives you smoother gradients, smoother weather effects, the mist over the water, the lighting effects, there's an enhanced nuanced shade variety, and that gives you smoother look to these gradients that kind of thing, smoother progressions of shade. But again, things overall did just look universally bright, but not super bright, and they look kind of a bit flooded, really. Again, the strong contrast of the panel helps a little bit here, but doesn't completely offset the fact that you've basically got your black depth and the depth of those dark shades raised well above what they should be. And also, there's no real pop to those bright elements in comparison, so those bright elements should be much brighter than that. You know, you're limited to 320 candles per meter squared, and that's your maximum you're going to see even for pure white. So they just don't stand out, these bright elements, in the way that they should under HDR at all. The 10-bit colour reproduction also helps it put its colour gamut to good use. As I said, 90% DCI-P3. So under HDR, instead of sRGB being targeted for your colour gamut, REC 2020, a massive gamut, is actually targeted. And in the near term, the developers have good DCI-P3 coverage in mind for their content to at least look decent. So 90% DCI-P3, the saturation levels aren't as strong as they could be for some of these shades, but you still get some decent vibrancy in places, decent saturation to some elements, but more importantly, I suppose, is the fact that the elements that are oversaturated under SDR are toned down. So this rock, for example, under SDR has too much of a copper tint. Lara's skin tone as well looks too reddish. 
She doesn't look as ghoulish as she does in the video, by the way. I know her face looks pure white at the moment, but it's not actually like that, it's just the video. But essentially, things are toned down, things look more appropriate, but there are those flashes of vibrancy where the developers want them, such as the greens here. Fairly lush, but not as lush looking as I've seen on some models. It's not only the colour gamut which would affect that, but actually these medium shades, they should have extra depth as well. So they're universally high luminance without good precision, without proper local dimming or anything like that. It's not helping there at all. Well, I wasn't actually meaning to go on this scene, but I'll go with it since I'm there. Just to show you that things do not look deep and atmospheric. There's no local dimming, there's a universally high luminance level, so things look just flooded. They don't look quite as bad as they do on the camera or on the video, but even to my eye in this dark room, things do not look pleasant. This was the scene I was actually meant to show you. Things do look more pleasant because it's not full of dark shades and things looking really unatmospheric. But again, the colour reproduction, yes, it's more appropriate than it is under SDR because things are toned down. There are some reasonable saturation levels for some elements, such as the blue flowers here and the berries here or the fruit here but it doesn't have the kind of depth I've seen on some models with a more generous colour gamut. The same with these green shades as well. They look fairly lush, fairly deep, and also the yellowish greens are toned down, so they look better than they do under SDR in that respect, more natural, whilst still having shades which are well beyond the sRGB colour space. However, they don't look as lush and deep and as eye-catching as they should, partly because of the colour gamut and partly because of the lack of precision with the luminance levels. I think I've really hammered this point to death now though, there's no point in really saying too much more about this, I just wanted to show this scene for a little bit of extra variety. HDR in this model, it's really very basic. I have seen a worse HDR performance and that's because some models with a colour gamut that runs very close to sRGB will still claim to be HDR. And again, the fact it's a VA model helps a bit with its native contrast anyway, but be under no illusion, this is not a true HDR experience by any stretch of the imagination. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. So this monitor has 165Hz refresh rate, that means it's outputting up to 2.75 times as much information every second as a 60Hz monitor, or indeed this monitor running at 60Hz. This brings two main advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel, so that describes the fluidity and the precision when you're interacting with the game world. That's something which low input lag also helps with, and this monitor does have low input lag, and it certainly has a low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. I measured a little bit above three milliseconds for overall input lag on this model. The other advantage of the high frame rate, high refresh rate combination, so you can see my frame rate at the top right, the little green number there, 165. So I'm running the monitor at a good solid 165 frames a second, making the most out of the monitor in terms of its responsiveness. So this also decreases the perceived blur due to eye movement. That's explored on an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness. And it's also summarized in the written review in the responsiveness section. But essentially a lot of the perceived blur you see on a monitor is down to this eye movement, but it's reduced by an increase in frame rate and refresh rate. Pixel responsiveness is also important to consider when it comes to perceived blur, and this uses a VA panel, and like most VA panels, there are some weaknesses to be aware of. For the scene here, it's mainly light to medium shades, although there's some dark shades mixed in, and the monitor doesn't perform too badly here for the panel type, really. It does have this sort of mask of perceived blur, which is beyond what you might expect from an IPS type panel, but it's mainly the dark transitions, and I'll show you them and focus a bit more on them shortly. But I think it's important to compare this with a few other models first. So I'm going to show you some Pursuit photographs, which are from the written review. And there's a comparison with the Gigabyte G32QC, which is a VA model, and the Gigabyte M27Q, which is an IPS type model. So you can see there are some weaknesses. There is a distinct trailing behind the object particularly for the darker background, which is the top row, but also to some extent for the remaining transitions. But this isn't as extensive as it is on the G32QC that I tested, but it's certainly more pronounced than it is on the Gigabyte M27Q. Now the M27Q, I use that as a reference because it isn't a perfect IPS model, but it is at a level which most people are very comfortable with, even so. But you can see that this AOC is quite a bit weaker than that. But for this scene here, there isn't really anything which I'd describe so much as a smeary trailing. There's perhaps what I'd call heavy powdery trailing behind the block up there, for example. It's also worth mentioning that there are different overdrive settings and that you could see them in the Pursuit photograph. I consider medium optimal and that's what I'm using at the moment. I can switch over to strong and 
you would have seen from the Pursuit photographs that Strong actually looked quite good. It probably looked like the optimal setting for those particular transitions. The issue I have with it is that there's some rather obvious overshoot in places. You should be able to see that hopefully in the video as a sort of bright halo trailing towards the left of the building here. I'm not sure if this will actually come across on the video. It's not super obvious, but it's pretty eye-catching to me, and it's quite colourful as well. It has a sort of cyan tint. It's a bit different to the blue of the sky in the background, and it just stands out for that reason. And this is just one example. I've, I've done quite a lot of testing with this strong setting, and there are some pixel transitions which show a lot of this overshoot, and I found it quite eye-catching, quite unsightly, so I prefer the medium setting. Depending on your sensitivities, some people may prefer the strong setting. I'll come back to the strong setting a little bit later, but I'm going to switch back to medium for now. I'm on a different scene on Battlefield 5, and you'll be able to see straight away from the video, I'm sure, unless you have a very slow monitor, there is a smeary appearance of some of the trailing now, around the, the guy up there, for example, around this flag, around the boats down here. It isn't as extensive as on some models, and this kind of... These weaker transitions aren't as widespread, but there are lots of darker shades now, and that's really where this model struggled, and most VA models will definitely struggle. So these are certainly some quite pronounced weaknesses. I find them quite eye-catching. It does significantly increase the perceived blur where these transitions are present, though not to the extent of some models again, like that Gigabyte I mentioned, the G32QC, which I tested. But there are definitely distinct weaknesses. There's no getting around this. You can reduce them slightly by changing to the strong setting. But actually, a lot of them still remain. And there's also some overshoot in places. There's some really rather eye-catching overshoot around the flag there. Again, I'm not sure if this will come across on the video, I'm afraid. It's difficult to capture these kind of things sometimes. And around the makeshift roof up there as well. You might be able to see some sort of colourful appearance in places. That's generally overshoot that you're seeing there. Let's switch back to my preferred medium setting again. Another thing to be aware of, now this occurs whether you're using medium or strong as well, you'll see that bush when I move, it darkens during movement, but then it lightens up again when the movement ceases. That's because there's a mixture of dark and medium shades, or dark and somewhat lighter shades, which are blending together, and the brighter shades or the medium shades, they're becoming darker than they should and blending into the background too much. And this gives you a sort of flickering effect during movement. It's not just for this bush that it'll happen, this is just a good example. And actually you can see it on the desktop as well in places. I'm just going to show you an example of this. So I'm on Twitter. This is just an example. There are other web pages which will show similar behaviour. If you use the default theme, and I generally find this with other websites as well, this is quite common to see a white background with dark text. The weaknesses aren't really too apparent. A little bit of extra trailing in places, and of course it's not just generally black and white. There are various other shades to consider as well. So the weaknesses aren't too bad for a VA model here. Actually, none of the weaknesses are too bad for a VA model in general, but just comparatively speaking. The dim setting. The weakness is a bit more pronounced. There's a more distinct powdery trailing, perhaps a heavy powdery trailing, i describe it as. But where the real issues occur is if you're on the lights out setting. So now you've got some really quite problematic transitions. You've got the black background with the medium grey text, and this has that flickering phenomenon when you're scrolling. So again, it's blending into the black background because of the weaknesses in pixel responsiveness. You can see it for lots of text and different elements there. So again, this is just an example. There are other websites which will show this. I wouldn't say it's going to be something that's going to bother everyone, and if you just move the window as well, it, it shows it in, in much the same way. It isn't something which is going to bother everyone, but I'm just trying to point out that even if you're just on the desktop, some of these weaknesses in pixel responsiveness can still be apparent. Back on Battlefield 5 again. And I've got the game running at about 100 or 90 to 100 frames a second. And I'm using Adaptive Sync, so this monitor does support Adaptive Sync. You can use AMD FreeSync with a compatible AMD GPU, and you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, which is what I'm using right at the moment with a compatible NVIDIA GPU. And more specifically, it's AMD FreeSync Premium, and that is supported by HDMI and DisplayPort, whereas on the NVIDIA side, it's DisplayPort only. 
for NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, but it works in much the same way. I explored this on an NVIDIA and AMD GPU. There is a common issue with flickering on VA models because they're very sensitive to the voltage changes that occur when the refresh rate is changing. But on this model, it wasn't bad at all, actually, in that respect. There were some examples of flickering during particularly heavy fluctuations or sudden large drops in frame rate, that kind of thing, but it wasn't intense and it wasn't widespread. It wasn't like I'd often see on VA models in a VRR environment, so I was actually quite impressed in that respect with this one. Another thing which was quite impressive is that there is an increase in overshoot. You might be able to see this a bit around the tree, but there isn't an introduction of extreme overshoot. And in fact, I would just stick to the medium setting throughout the entire VRR range. So I'm not quite at the bottom of the VRR range at the moment. As I said, I'm around 90 to 100 frames a second or around 90 frames a second at the moment. I will get my frame rate down a little bit more very shortly, but just sticking to this sort of frame rate again, some of the weaknesses are less pronounced now. The pixel response requirements are greatly reduced for optimal performance, but you can still see that kind of flickering because the weaknesses are pronounced enough there. You can see some smeary trailing still. So even though the pixel response requirements for optimal performance are reduced, the pixel responses for these weaknesses, they're still pronounced enough to cause issues. If you switch over to the strong setting now, the overshoot becomes really rather unsightly, rather extreme in my view. Again, this may not come across on the video, but to my eye, it is very eye-catching indeed. And even so, some of the smeary trailing does remain. The weakest transitions remain weak. There's still that flickering effect, etc. So I would just stick to medium. I got things running at a solid 60 frames a second. I'm using the medium setting and the overshoot levels, again, they've increased a bit. There is some more overshoot in places, but I wouldn't say it's extreme overshoot, certainly not by adaptive sync standards. And now the weaknesses in pixel responsiveness are less distinct. You do get a little bit of that sort of flickering effect, just a little bit. It's much reduced now though. The smeary trailing, not as pronounced either. There is still some remaining, but it doesn't extend out as far from the object as it did before. The pixel response requirements for a good performance here have lowered quite significantly. With the reduction in frame rate, you do get an increase in perceived blur and you get a decrease in connected feel, but adaptive sync is still doing its thing. So it's getting rid of the tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches. And I didn't mention before, but if you didn't have adaptive sync on, you would get stuttering if you had vSync enabled, or you'd get tearing if you had vSync disabled. As someone sensitive to tearing and stuttering, I do like to have this technology doing its thing. If you really are particularly sensitive to overshoots, you may want to use the weak setting. So I've just switched over to that, and that does tone down the overshoot further, but I wouldn't say it was extreme before, and now the weaknesses are more pronounced. So you can see what I'd call breakup trailing. It might even look like overshoot on the video, but actually the colors leaching out from the makeshift roof there. You could see this actually at higher frame rates. I didn't really mention it specifically because I just, it's usually just banded into smeary trailing because really it's sort of part of the same thing. But sometimes you can see these colors leach out, just another form of weakness. Really, I consider medium does give a nice little boost to the pixel transitions overall without a strong level of overshoot. So that's what I prefer. The VRR range of this monitor, it's claimed to be 48 to 165 Hertz. Although in my testing, sometimes the floor of operation was a little bit higher than that, a few Hertz higher than that. I explore that more in the written review, but don't worry about this. It really doesn't make a lot of difference. Sometimes a little bit higher, but uh, only by a few Hertz, up to perhaps 53, 54, 55 Hertz sometimes. It depends what the refresh rate has come from, what kind of fluctuations are occurring. This did happen on both my NVIDIA and AMD GPUs, but it doesn't really make much difference in practice, to be honest, compared to 48 Hertz. Only thing to be aware of is that when the monitor goes below this floor of operation, then LFC, low frame rate compensation, kicks in, or that's what AMD calls it. NVIDIA has a similar technology. It does exactly the same thing. It's a frame to refresh multiplication technology, and it will keep the refresh rate synchronized with the frame rate by sticking to a multiplication of that. There is a switchover period because there's a sudden change in refresh rate, 
that does cause a very small amount of stuttering. This is a very small amount of stuttering. It's a lot less than you'd see normally if you didn't have VRR active at all. So not everyone's gonna notice this or find it bothersome even if they're frequently passing this boundary. But if you're sensitive to that, be aware of this. If you're frequently passing the boundary, you could potentially find this bothersome. There's also a slight flickering sometimes when this boundary is crossed, but it isn't the extreme flickering I often see on VA models. And it seems to depend on what is shown in the background. In fact, it's such slight flickering that I probably wouldn't even be able to show it on the video, which is why I'm not even gonna waste my time trying to do that. But just be aware of it. If you're frequently passing the boundary, you will have this slight flickering in places, you will have this slight stuttering. So it's not perfect, but at least there isn't extreme flickering as there is on some VA models. And of course, the overshoot levels are not extreme using my preferred medium setting either. So overall, I would say this is a reasonable performance for a VA model, but it certainly can't hold a candle to even a semi-decent modern IPS model when it comes to pixel responsiveness. There's also a strobe backlight setting called MBR, motion blur reduction. I'm not gonna show you that, but it is explored in the written review. And that's a much better format for exploring this kind of thing because all you see in the video is flickering. You can't see the benefits that this provides and it really isn't very interesting to look at, but it is explored in detail in the written review. So I explore the brightness and the contrast and brightness section, the impact it has on that. I explore it in the responsiveness section as well in terms of reduction in perceived blur and also my subjective experiences using the setting. So if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. To wrap up then, for the styling of the monitor, that's always subjective. I know some people don't like colorful elements. There are some red elements on it, but they're dark red and they don't appear as bright as they do in images of the monitor. So don't be too put off if you don't like that kind of thing. You don't generally notice them in practice. I can't say I'm a huge fan of the length of those front feet of the monitor. They do protrude rather far forwards, but the screen itself goes reasonably far back rather than being in line with the front edge of the stand feet, so that does help if you don't have a particularly large desk. The curve of the monitor will not escape your notice when you're using it. It's something which I found I did adapt to, to some extent. I was always quite aware of it, but less so for some tasks than others, and I did adapt a bit over time. I got more used to it as I used the monitor more. It's just one of those individual things, really. Some people will quite like it, other people not so much. It's a definite statement on this model. The 2560 by 1440 WQHD resolution, that delivers a reasonable but not particularly impressive pixel density with a screen of this size. It gives you a good amount of desktop real estate. This model did have some issues with the pixel rendering or the sub-pixel layout, and that's explored more in the written review, but it does give a little bit of a softer look to text and other fine elements than you would expect. In terms of the contrast performance, main strength of VA panels, and this one was no exception. It wasn't particularly strong, by VA standards, but it did lift itself above what a non-VA panel would give you for its normal static contrast without some sort of fancy local dimming or something like that. So I wouldn't say this gives a deep, inky, atmospheric look if you're sitting in a dark room, but it does give a deeper and more atmospheric look than a non-VA panel would in such conditions. And I also found it gave a bit of an advantage in slightly brighter viewing conditions, and that also reduces the VA glow and that kind of thing, because this model does have some VA glow to contend with. The color performance, it offers 90% DCI-P3 color space, so it gives you a bit of an edge in vibrancy compared to your standard sRGB color gamut. But that also means that you have oversaturation. Things aren't displayed as the developers intend. There's an sRGB emulation mode, but it locks off the brightness and various other settings in the monitor. And I wouldn't say mine was perfectly tuned in its sRGB setting. That's explored more in the written review, but just be aware that the setting is there. I wouldn't necessarily think most people would find it very useful though. The color consistency, there were some weaknesses there as usual for a VA panel, but actually this was about as good as I've seen from a VA panel in that department. So that was good to see, especially given the size of the screen. The HDR performance was largely unimpressive. The color gamut isn't wide enough for true HDR experience, although it is still a bit wider than sRGB, but it was really the contrast and the luminance side where things failed to impress. No local dimming whatsoever, no dynamic contrast even. Things just basically stick at the maximum brightness without any adjustment to the backlight, and that really doesn't give you a true or anything approaching proper HDR experience. In terms of responsiveness, the monitor put in a decent performance for the panel type, really. It isn't as strong as, you know, the upper-end VA panels like the Odyssey G7s and the G9s, but they're an exception. Most VA models I've used are 
similar to this, if not a bit weaker, similar to this AOC, if not a bit weaker. But there are still some distinct weaknesses with the smeary trailing and that kind of thing, which will bother some people, will sour the experience for some people. VRR worked well, variable refresh rate. It didn't have the same level of flickering I've often observed on VA models. There was some in places, but it wasn't as widespread, wasn't as obvious. I also liked that there was a single overdrive mode, which you could use throughout the VRR range without strong overshoot being introduced or overbearing levels of overshoot. And there's still benefits, even with these weaknesses to pixel responsiveness, there are benefits to the 165 Hz refresh rate, which was still present here. It also has good low input lag, so that wasn't an issue. So overall, I think this monitor will please some people. If they're looking for strong immersion, they tend to edge towards stronger contrast and they want decent color output as well, with quite a vibrant look to things. This one does deliver that. And it does so at a good price as well. It's priced very reasonably, somewhere around £370. It isn't available in all markets. The US, for example, it isn't available. But there are some IPS type alternatives which most people would probably prefer because they won't have the same issues as pixel responsiveness. They don't have those slight flickering issues either when VRR is used and they don't have issues with split sub-pixel rendering and the color consistency is also better. So I think sort of for overall performance I would tend to edge towards the IPS models but things are very subjective really. And one of the ones I'd recommend for this kind of price is a Gigabyte M32Q. I think that's a very well-rounded product overall. But really, it's very subjective. Everyone will have their own preferences. So as I said, some people will enjoy the experience that this AOC provides. That's really all there is to the AOC CQ32G3SU, or SE in some markets. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.